Welcome everyone to the fifth webinar in our webinar series on integrating with ArchivesSpace. Each webinar in this series will highlight an integration with another application used in archives that ArchivesSpace members have worked on or requested. The webinar series will feature both open source and proprietary systems. Our fifth webinar in this series will feature an integration with Archivematica, a web and standard ba standards based open source application which facilitates long term access to and preservation of digital content from Artifactual. In this webinar, Sarah Ronke, Program Manager for the Archivematica project at Artifactual Systems, will discuss Archivematica's model for integrating with other systems, including access and archival management systems like ArchivesSpace. Then, Heather Greer Klein, Outreach and Engagement Coordinator for Digital Technology Services at Lyricist, will share how the JuraCloud Preservation Storage Service can be used to preserve and store images that can be linked to ArchivesSpace digital object records. In her role, Heather collaborates with libraries, archives, museums, and nonprofit institutions of all sizes to identify and identify the right open source host, hosted preservation and access solutions for their needs. Next. Max Eckerd, Lead Archivist for Digital Initiatives at the Bentley Historical Library, will cover the Bentley's integration of ArchivesSpace and Archivematica to streamline digital archiving workflows. He will highlight the decision-making process behind integrating both systems, things he's he wishes he'd known then that he knows now, goals for the future, and other tips and tricks. In his role at the Bentley Historical Library, Max oversees the digitization program, digital curation activities, web archives, and associated infrastructure. Finally, Bonnie Gordon, Digital Archivist at the Rockefeller Archive Center, will present on the Archivematica Archive Space Dissemination Information Package Upload Integration. This integration links access copies of digital objects that have been ingested in Archivematica to their existing description in Archive Space. In her role at the Rockefeller Archive Center, Bonnie focuses on digital preservation, foreign digital records, and training around technology. We will hold all questions until the Q&A session at the end. If you type a question into the chat, it will be read and answered during the Q&A. You will notice your microphone and camera were muted when you entered. We ask that you keep your microphone muted until the Q&A session at the end. With that, I'll welcome Sarah, Heather, Max, and Bonnie. Sarah, if you'd like to start us off. Thank you, Jessica. Um, just a quick confirmation that my microphone's working and you can hear me. We can hear you. Perfect. It's great. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. Um, we were really pleased to be asked to be part of this webinar. Um, Archivematica has had um, integration with ArchivesSpace and uh, before that Archivist Toolkit for um, quite some time. So it's a great opportunity to talk about um, sort of where it's come from and where it could possibly go in the future. So for, I just wanted to start with our basic uh, definition of what Archivematica is, just in case some of you aren't familiar or there might be a little bit of confusion, um, but this is basically the same definition that Jessica just gave in the introduction. Um, it's a, basically, it's a digital preservation system and it's, um, it's web-based and standards-based, meaning that you interact with it via uh, a web interface for the most part, although there are um, API applications as well. It's standards-based in that it uses well-adopted and um, and well-known digital preservation uh, standards and reference models, such as OIAS, METS, PREMIS, Dublin Core, that kind of thing. And it's open source. And this is really important to us at Artifactual Systems. Um, we're uh, primarily responsible for maintaining two open source applications, Archivematica, as well as um, access to memory or Atom and uh, open source is very much at the center of our ethos and uh, we're very dedicated to that mission. So anybody can use and download Archivematica or Atom on their own. Um, you can install it, you can ask questions on the user forum. Uh, the way that we um, support this work at Artifactual Systems is we offer services around those, um, those software systems, but it's, it's always uh, remains open source. So the way that Archivematica basically works is you take the content that you want to preserve and in some cases also provide access to. It gets ingested into the system. Archivematica performs a variety of digital preservation access, um, excuse me, digital preservation actions on that material and packages it into uh, AIPs, archival information packages, and uh, DIPs, dissemination information packages. So it's very much aligned with OIS. If you're trying to refer to the OIS model, or if you're doing um, 
track um, certification, if you're doing trusted repository audit and certification, then there's certain uh, checkboxes that using Archivematica can check off for you. Of course, there's certain checkboxes that only you yourselves as human beings can uh, check off things like policy and procedure and so on. So it's not that a system, uh, no system can bring you into full OAS compliance on its own, but it's very much aligned with the way OAS describes the, the process of digital preservation. It's, it's also, and this is pertinent to today's uh, discussion, it's agnostic to what storage and access systems you use with it. So you can store your AIPs in a variety of systems, and actually Max might uh, touch on the fact that they at Bentley store their AIPs in vSpace uh, repository, for example, but you could be storing your AIPs in S3 or in local storage or whatever. Um, and you can also use different access or archival management systems with it. Um, and this is achieved by creating agnostic packages that are in open and widely adopted formats like bags, basically. So the AIPs are packaged as bags. Um, so in the, the sort of universe of different access or data management or archival management systems, Archivematica has um, some manner of handshake or relationship or understanding of or integration with all of these different systems. Um, or at least we can say each of them have been used in conjunction with using Archivematica for the digital preservation piece. Um, each of these systems work very differently. You, you might be familiar with more than one of them. Um, and uh, as a result of that, the, um, the way that the integration with Archivematica works is different in each case. What Archivematica does, just to um, revisit that for a moment. So as I mentioned, it's sort of a, it's a pipeline model. So um, digital objects and metadata go through one end and out the other end, you get packages. <laughs> um, so the, the process of ingesting material, uh, verifying that it is what you think it is, um, identifying file formats, characterizing and extracting metadata, um, optionally, you can do things like arrange, so you can rearrange your material. I think um, both Max and Body might touch on that, or Max at least. Um, normalize, so you can um, change file formats into other uh, more preservation or access friendly formats if you choose to. You can add descriptive metadata and then the system packages it up and sends your apes off to long-term storage and dissemination packages go to whatever system that you're working with or in a place where that system can interact with them. Um, and that'll probably become a little bit more obvious when you see um, Max and Bonnie's uh, presentations a little bit later. So in terms of how um, we've approached integration with Archivematica uh, uh, with other systems in the past, um, we've up to um, up to this point in our history of, uh, of Archivematica's development, um, we've been following sort of uh, what's known as the bounty model approach, which means that an institution approaches us to say, we have this goal of making Archivematica work with, say, archive space. Um, and what we do is um, we, uh, you can hire artifactual systems to do the development. Um, and then when the development, the, the integration is done, we fold it into the public release of the project so that everybody who wants to use it can benefit from it. Um, you can also submit your own code for integrations or for other kinds of features. Um, and uh, we try to facilitate that as much as possible as well. And so this bounty model, um, you know, it's very interesting. It has some definite pros. Um, it's, you know, it's based on real life workflows. So when a client comes to us and, and wants to um, use Archivematica in conjunction with Archivespace or another system. It's not based on us at Artifactual making a bunch of assumptions about how that should work. It's based on an actual real life workflow. Um, and it also has the pro of integration becoming available for others to use. The con is that it's sort of based on one real life workflow, or maybe in this case, two real life workflows. Both Max and Body worked with Artifactual systems. Their institutions worked with us to develop these integrations. So there's now like kind of two different ways that you can do it, which is uh, great. Um, but also we don't really have in this model a way, in this financial model, a way of getting broad community consensus to uh, tell us the right approach to doing an integration. 
So that's a challenge that we've been facing um, over the years. Um, we try to mitigate the risks of this by taking a handshake approach. Um, so what we try to do is have handoffs from Archivematica to other systems, or in some cases, the other way around, and try not to make the integrations too tight. Um, the examples that you're going to see today, I would say, are uh, in the on the spectrum of being a bit of a tighter integration. Um, and but we we really learned lessons in the past um, and are trying to uh, to mitigate that um, risk even more now. Um, so just to draw an example from a different access system, um, we have a workflow that you can work with content DM. And in very early versions of Archivematica, there was a very tight integration between Archivematica and Content DM, and you logged in using your Content DM uh, credentials and you know tried to pass the package directly to Content DM. It was very, very difficult to maintain. Content DM is not an open source system, so we didn't really have access to its code, and it was very difficult. And uh, as a result of that, we ended up kind of removing that and simplifying it and making it so Archivematica is now just able to make a package that's compliant with Content DM and how the user takes it and hands it off to Content DM. It's really up to them. Um, we don't make it a tight integration in that way. Um, going forward, we're interested in taking more API-driven approaches. Um, we've introduced an API client called AM Client recently, um, so that it's a more standardized way that different systems can talk to Archivematica. Um, or that Archivematica can communicate uh, information that's needed by other systems um, based on API calls rather than based on uh, type integrations with those systems. So that's the approach that we're um, uh, planning to uh, pursue uh, more and more as we go forward. And I'm going to change slides now and uh, but hand the mic virtually over to Heather. Thanks, Sarah. So hi there, I just want to take a moment out of today's webinar and highlight two uh, services and an integration that might be of interest. So Lyricist Digital Technology Services partners with Artifactual and we offer a hosted Archivematica that has hosted preservation storage uh, attached. That's a service called Archives Direct. And we also offer a standalone preservation storage system. It's an open source service called DuraCloud. Uh, so DuraCloud is most often used for long-term preservation storage, such as for the AIPs that are generated by Archivematica. Uh, but DuraCloud also has an option to make some content in storage publicly available with predictable URLs. And so what that means is that it's really easy to preserve and store images in DuraCloud and link them to ArchivesSpace digital object records. So in the next slide, I'm going to show you an example of that. All right, great. So here we have uh, the U.S. Naval War College Naval Historical Collections archives. They are a dirt. They use the Dirt Cloud service for preservation storage, and they've designated a collection of images that are linked in archive space to digital object records. So this is a screenshot of a digital object record and includes a link to view or download an associated object that's being stored in Dura Cloud. And if you'd like more information about this integration or about hosted Archivematica, please feel free to reach out, send me an email, and I'm always happy to help. With that, I want to turn things over to our next speaker. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Max Eckerd. I'm the lead archivist for digital initiatives at the Bentley Historical Library and talking about archive space and Archivematica integration here at the Bentley. Uh, I thought I'd start um, with an overview of our institution, institutional context and our kind of technical ecosystem. I actually borrowed this slide from a colleague of mine, Dallas Pullen, who recently gave a very similar webinar in this uh, very integrations with archive space webinar series on archive space, archive it integration. So spoiler alert, we're really into systems integrations here. <laughs> um, and as you can see, um, you know, we've got a lot going on. We use archive space for administrative and descriptive metadata, archive it for web archiving, archive Manica for foreign digital processing slash ape creation, dspace for preservation and access to uh, foreign digital materials, 
Altura is a streaming AV access platform. We use a University of Michigan developed platform called DLXS for, for kind of um, publishing finding aids and also digitized text and image collections. And we use Aeon for requests for circulation management. And I, I feel like it's really important to note that these systems are, are used by a wide variety of stakeholders within the Bentley. And that includes kind of the, the back of the house curation team, as well as the front of the house, even though I don't really like those divides, but front of the house reference and academic programs team, um, as well as beyond. And this includes um, you know, novice researchers like University of Michigan undergrads, but also more advanced researchers from both inside and outside the University of Michigan, com Michigan community, as well as the general public. And these systems, you know, they're likewise hosted and technically supported by a wide variety of stakeholders. And so for some, we're relying on um, the University of Michigan's central library's IT, for others, the university's central IT, and for still others, we're actually experimenting with kind of going in our own and seeing how that goes. Um, and managing all these systems, uh, as I'm sure you might be able to imagine, especially the handoffs of data and metadata between them can get overwhelming. And so we actively look for ways to integrate them with one another, creating a kind of functional coupling between them so that they act as a coordinated whole and do that to fulfill a number of archival workflows. And actually, the integration that I'll be talking about today was part of this larger project that's referenced at the bottom. This is sort of the one that kicked this whole thing off for us. So the Archivematica archive space um, integration that I'll talk about today was actually part of a larger Mellon Foundation funded, funded Archive Space, Archive Medica DSpace workflow integration project that was 2014 to 2016 that united three open source platforms. And the Archive Space, Archive Medica, the point of that uh, portion of the integration was um, to facilitate the creation and reuse of descriptive and administrative metadata across preservation and management systems. But um, for some additional context, as part of the overall workflow, we also wanted to streamline the ingest and deposit of content into a preservation repository, that would be DSpace, uh, for, for us at least to find solutions that met the Bentley's local needs, but which were also flexible and scalable for other institutions, um, modular so that institutions may adopt some, none, or all of the development features, and based upon open standards so that other tools and or repository platforms could be integrated. And finally, to share all code and documentation with the archives and digital preservation communities. And just to give you a sense of why we might be interested in doing something like this, um, let me show you a little bit of where we were coming from. So we had been doing digital processing with a bunch of localized, very disparate silos of data and metadata that didn't really work together at all. And so, for example, um, this is how we track it. Sessions. This is a FileMaker Pro database that uh, called Beal. <laughs> um, we also used to do arrangement and description work of both physical and digital archives in Microsoft Word documents and would generate encoded archival description or EAD using macros that were applied to various styles in those Microsoft Word documents. And uh, we did digital processing with a tool called the Automated Processor or AutoPro, which was a homegrown digital preservation tool written in Windows shell scripts. And yeah, so to, to continue with why, um, while the use of FileMaker Pro, Microsoft Word, and AutoPro, and you know, to be honest, a whole bunch of other kind of spreadsheets and databases um, for digital processing definitely lowered technical barriers and introduced efficiencies into our digital processing initiatives, there were numerous shortcomings. Um, the use of a file, Custom FileMaker Pro database, for example, really limited our ability to take advantage of the affordances of more widely used systems, you know, things like Archon and Archivist Toolkit and later on ArchivesSpace, such as the ability to integrate with other tools. Um, using Microsoft Word to generate EADs, while that was certainly easier than hand coding XML, um, training people how to do it was really hard um, and uh, made the process very localized and way more complicated than, say, you know, archive space for entering descriptive information. AutoPro had really limited error handling, um, a poor, although I, I think that point is arguable, a poor user interface and various support issues, and in, in general was never really intended to be a long-term solution. Um, and I would say kind of in general, um, there was a, this lack of well-defined systems of record here. And what this meant was that there's a lot of duplicate or redundant metadata entry 
and various platforms and also meant that we had a really hard time trying to manage all this metadata over time. Um, none of these tools, I'll just add, helped us work at scale, like at all. Uh, meanwhile, ArchivesSpace and Archivematica had emerged as two of the most exciting open source platforms for working with digital archives. Um, we were in the process of adopting ArchivesSpace to be our system of record for descriptive and administrative metadata and had begun a gradual migration of metadata from these disparate systems into ArchivesSpace. And we had also began to adopt Archivematica to be our system of record for digital processing or ape creation and had begun to move uh, our digital backlog into Archivematica. And, you know, best of all, both of these systems and DSpace2, although that's not quite what this webinar is about, were designed to play nicely with others. Um, and by that, I just mean that, like Sarah said, they use common metadata standards. They have application programming interfaces or APIs. They're open source, although that's not necessarily a prerequisite for systems integration. It definitely helps. Uh, you know, they have kind of uh, architectures that allow them to have plugins, all sorts of things. Things. So they were designed to play nicely with others. So we sponsored, as part of this grant project, some new development in Archivematica. Essentially, you know, so we paid Artifactual to develop a new appraisal and arrangement tab in Archivematica. So in addition to being the spot where this Archivespace Archivematica integration would happen, this introduced functionality to appraise and review digital content from within Archivematic. And I'm not going to talk about that at all, but um, if you have questions about it, feel free to ask Sarah or I about it, and we'd be happy to answer them. As it pertains to this webinar, however, uh, it integrated Archivematica and Archivespace via the introduction of an Archivespace pane within the Appraisal and Arrangement tab. And this feature utilizes the Archivespace API to display resource records in a tree view, um, depicting the intellectual hierarchy of archival objects in Archivespace to create and edit descriptive metadata for new or existing archival objects. So you know, kind of author, authored in Archivematica, but written to Archivespace, or while being written to Archivespace. And it also permits archivists to drag and drop digital content onto archival description to create Archivespace digital object records. After launching the ingest of uh, SIPs and Archivematica, a related integration of Archivematica and DSpace automatically uploads a fully ingested ape and associated descriptive meta metadata as a unique item in DSpace. And the persistent URL of that item, uh, its, its handle, will in turn be written back to ArchivesSpace so that it may serve as a link to either the, to the digital content, either in ArchivesSpace or when the archival description is exported to an EAD finding aid. So I thought we would just show this real quick uh, with a little screencast. So here we are in Archivematica. Um, within the appraisal tabs archive space pane, you can search for an existing archive space resource by title or identifier and pull up its resource tree. You can edit a minimal amount of existing metadata on a particular component of that tree. Alternatively, um, you can create new components below a selected component and enter a slightly expanded set of metadata. A key point here is that any changes that you make are automatically written back to Archivespace via its API in real time. So Archivematica here is acting as kind of the system of engagement while Archivespace is acting as the system of record in terms of descriptive information. Optionally, um, you can edit uh, rights metadata. I'm not actually gonna talk about that here. Um, once an Archivespace component with which to, di uh, to associate digital content has been identified or created, um, an Archivespace digital object instance can be associated with that component and files or folders from Archivematica can be dragged and dropped onto it. So this essentially is linking digital objects with their intellectual hierarchy and description. And after all relevant content has been associated with the given digital object, you can finalize this arrangement to initiate the rest of Archivematica's ingest workflow, which is being shown here. Fast forward a bit. Uh, during Archivematica's final ingest microservice called Store Ape, uh, archivists select the Archivematica location corresponding to the appropriate DSpace collection to which the ape will be stored. And once this process begins, Archivematica fetches key bits of descriptive metadata about the ape from Archivespace. It goes on to deposit both, both the kind of package of data and metadata to DSpace all automatically. Uh, and you can see it there. So finally, Archivematica completes the deposit by making use of the Archivespace API to write the handle of the DSpace item back to the file URI of the linked digital object in Archivespace. As you can see here. All right, so.
all in all, this systems integration, when mapped to a digital preservation workflow, like uh, uh, Justin Thulon, the Digital Curation Center, uh, Center's curation lifecycle model, looks something like this. As you might be able to see, um, Archivematica is primarily the one doing the driving, and a lot of the development happens within Archivematica. Um, data is flowing both bi-directionally and unidirectionally between systems at various stages in the workflow. And Archivematica is using various integration methodologies like uh, the Archives API to integrate with ArchivesSpace, as well as SWORD um, and D the DSpace API to integrate with DSpace, even though I didn't really touch on those. Okay. So this all happened like four years ago. And you might be asking, how well has the systems integration aged? Uh, so I would say pretty well, actually. Um, we still use it uh, to this day, actually just this morning. Um, and it has survived upgrades to both archive space. We had started on 2.2 and are now on 2.5 something. And Archivematica, we have been on 1.6 and recently upgraded to 1.9 as well as the latter's migration to a new server here. On, so it's kind of um, been robust enough to survive those changes. I will say, and I swear Sarah and I did not um, coordinate this, <laughs> but I will say uh, that the particular workflow that I outlined here, uh, we actually use that less and less. Um, it works really well for relatively small heterogeneous transfers of digital content but that doesn't exactly match the kinds of accessions or transfers that we usually get, which more often are either small and homogenous or regardless of their kind of, uh, whether they're homogenous or heterogeneous, they're definitely trending on the bigger and bigger side, you know, whether you measure that by number of files or size. And as I showed earlier, um, we also have some more specialized platform, platforms for, you know, serving up digitized images and streaming audiovisual material. And this particular workflow obviously connects to DSpace, but not to them. So that said, uh, we do use this strategy of integration and in particular with systems like ArchivesSpace and Archivematica and various other repository platforms that are designed to play nicely with others. So not just any, but the ones that are designed to play nicely with others more and more. And that kind of leads me to lessons learned. So, if it's not obvious, uh, we definitely drink the Kool-Aid and think systems integration is where it's at. Side note, uh, it turns out that the integration of people is as challenging, if not more challenging, than the integration of systems, which was sort of just proxies for those people, which is why I mentioned all of those stakeholders at the beginning. Um, so looking back, I think we'd say now that more important than any particular workflow is is just simply having systems that are designed to, to play nicely with others, um, even without being super prescriptive about how they should play nicely together with a particular workflow. And, and it actually occurred to me, preparing the slide, that even within Archivematica, this is the case. Um, there's no, there's, you know, there's one place to configure integration with archive space generally. And likewise, there's one ish, I think, one ish set of scripts that interacts with archive space, and that's agent archives. Um, even though it enables at least two different workflows, the one I just talked about and the one I that I will talk about. Um, beyond that, I would say that the kind of technical and project management upskilling we did as a team uh, while implementing migrating to, migrating to and integrating Archive Space and Archive Matica was also really important. And you know, Artifactual actually helped us a lot with that. Um, you know, we learned a lot about how to make our tools work for us. Um, and you know, not the other way around. Um, and as some evidence of that, here are a couple of GitHub repositories with code that various people on our team have developed based off of these integrations and the workflow they support. So this first one is some Ape repackaging scripts uh, to support repackaging and depositing Archivematica Apes to DSpace. So essentially, these help us to replicate the integration part of what I just showed without locking us into a particular appraisal tab workflow. And so it can kind of help with those other use cases I outlined. Uh, similarly, um, Dapper is a Python-based API wrapper for DSpace that, again, um, allows us to get data and metadata into and out of DSpace in a programmatic way without being forced to use a particular workflow. So all of this results in the fact that um, we're actually a lot more flexible now in how we approach digital processing. You know, we much prefer to sort of sit down with a digital processing problem 
think about what we want the end product to look like and all the different ways we might get there, see what patterns emerge and go from there. And uh, that's all I had, but we're saving questions for the end, but thank you. And here's some references and some resources. And with that, I'll stop sharing. Um, so I am Bonnie Gordon. I'm a digital archivist at the Rockefeller Archive Center, and I'm going to talk about our Archive Medica archive space dip upload integration. So I'm going to um, provide an overview of our use case and what the integration does, uh, kind of quickly walk through the integration, um, and then talk a bit about the specifics of our implementation and how we use it now. Um, but first, um, I wanted to talk a bit about what this integration centers on, which is an Archive Matica DIP. Um, and Sarah gave an overview of kind of what Archive Matica does and what it produces, uh, but kind of to reiterate a little bit, the DIP is the copy of digital objects um, that is what is given to an end user for access purposes. So the DIP includes access copies of the original digital objects from the transfer, either created by Archive Matica or provided by the user with the transfer, um, and then the dip includes a dip nets file, um, and then it can include a thumbnail as well. Um, so this kind of screenshot shows um, an Archive Medica dip and kind of its structure. Um, so when a transfer is ingested into Archive Medica, you have the option to create it or not. Um, but when it is created, the user has the option of storing a copy of the dip somewhere, as well as uploading metadata about the dip to an external system. So this Archive Medica Archive Space integration focuses on the latter, which is uploading metadata about the access object to Archive Space, and that's what I'm going to focus on talking about. So the requirements for this feature came out of our need to link digitize to link a lot of digitized objects to their description Archive Space. So this meant that description already existed in Archive Space, and that we needed to link digital objects at scale. These needs also influence some features, such as the ability for digital objects to inherit notes from the archive space components that they're attached to. So um, also to just kind of emphasize that this integration is really about access and not about managing preservation files. Um, so this integration sends metadata about a dip to archive space from Archive Manica. The dip metadata is written as a digital object in archive space that's attached to an existing component. And this linking happens either through manual matching in the Archive Matica dashboard or by including a CSV file that has archive space rec IDs with the ingest. Um, in a minute, I'm gonna talk more about the manual matching as well as the automated matching um, kind of options for this. So the um, digital object metadata includes technical metadata produced by Archive Matica during the course of ingesting a transfer, as well as premise rates information that is provided before or during Archive Matica ingest. Um, so this is a mapping of how premise rates information is run to archive space, and all of this is run at the digital object level. Um, so the publish um, Boolean as well as the um, conditions governing use note are uh, derived from information in the premise publish act. So whether there's a restriction or grant, as well as note content, and then the restrictions Boolean and the conditions governing access notes similarly are based on the Disseminate Act. Um, so then um, the other thing before I walk through um, kind of the integration is this is a archive space digital object that was created by Archive Matica. Um, so to quickly walk through like what was created and what's mapped. So the title of the digital object is the file name of the original digital object. Um, and then the identifier um, is the beginning of the URI, so not including the file name. And then the full file URI is in the file versions, um, as well as file size and some other information that is derived from Archive Matica and then passed along to Archive Space. Um, and then in the existence and location of original note, of originals now it is the um, UID of the ape, so the link to the original preservation pa package. Um, so for the integration itself, um, the settings are set in the Archive Matica administration tab where you can 
uh, put in your archive space credentials for the integration itself, as well as kind of um, set some defaults for the metadata that's written to archive space. So if you're not including premise rights information, um, you can set that here, um, as well as like object type and use statement and other things that you might want to have written to your digital object. Um, so like I mentioned, there's manual matching and automated matching, and I'm gonna walk through manual matching first. Um, so for the kind of premise write statements briefly, um, you can add them during ingest and archive Matica here by clicking this will add metadata button um, and then add rights information here. Um, but as far as the meat of the integration is um, add this task in Archive Manica for upload dip. Um, if I select upload dip to archive space, um, what is loaded is I filtered out to the resource record that I know I want to link to, um, but it'll list all resources in archi from archive space. Um, and load it here. So I can filter, I filter here. If I click this, um, it will then load kind of all children of that resource record and you can continue kind of down through the tree um, until you get to the component that you want to link your digital objects to, which I clicked here. Um, and then, is um, here's the page to assign objects. So here are all my digital files here um, with their file names. For this, I'm going to select all. And then here is the component I'm linking it to. Um, and then I can pair them, shows the pairs down here. Um, and then I can review my matches um, and then finally submit them. So that's how that matching happens. Um, from the, for the automated workflow um, that involves, um, for the premise rights information, you can include a CSV with rights info, which for each file and basis, there's a row, um, which you can see here. And then there's an archive space ref ID CSV, um, which includes the full file path to the original digital object um, as in one column, and then the kind of linking information to archive space, which is the component ref ID in the other. Um, so that um, was a walkthrough of kind of um, the integration. One other final piece um, is that we do, I mentioned that the dip is stored um, in a location um, in Archive Matica, we uh, copy those access files over to a web server, um, which is what that um, kind of file URI links to, that image that is then embedded in a finding aid. So in our finding aid, you can see our digital objects listed. Um, and then um, if you click on the digital object itself, you can see kind of the information from archive space because it's the finding aid, um, and then the actual PDF that's being linked to. Um, so kind of to get back to, so I showed those two different ways of using this integration. Um, and we basically exclusively use the automated functionality. Um, and we pretty much only use this feature for digitization projects, because like I mentioned, um, description already needs to be in archive space. Um, so for digitization projects that does exist already. Um, and due to the nature of our digitization workflow, we're able to automate the creation of those um, archive space ref ID CSV files, which has allowed us to really scale up. Um, so that was an overview of the Archive Matica archive space dip upload integration and how we use it here at the RAC. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Bonnie, and thank you, everyone. That was really great. Um, I am going to share my screen with uh, the names and contact information of um, all of our presenters. Well, I'm going to try to do that. But while I'm doing that, if you uh, if you have a question for the presenters, feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask or type it into the chat. 
If you type a question into the chat, I will read it for the, for the group. And while we're waiting for any questions in the chat, I'll go ahead and, and let everyone know that when we post the recording of this webinar, I'll also make sure to include all of the slides from all of our presenters today. So all of that great information will be available to you that way. All right, we've got a question in the chat uh, for Heather. Are thumbnails available when linking images from Jura Cloud to Archive Space? Uh, great question. Yes, they are. Um, and I could, um, I have an example of another Dura Cloud customer who's doing that. I'm not sure what they're doing quite differently, um, but that would be something I could work with my technical team on. Um, but I do know that that's an option. Thank you, Heather. Um, another question, how do these work with a digital object at the component level rather than individual files? Hmm, I'm not sure I understand the question. I apologize. Um, is the, are we, so like a simple digital object. So instead of being individual files, it's mm -hmm. one large digital object that represents an entire item. Is that is that the question? How do you work with the digital object at the component level? Yes, complex, complex object. objects. Um, I'm I'm not. We don't have any clients right now who are using. Um, this linking for complex objects. The use case I'm most familiar with is, is just linking individual files and particularly image files. Maybe add that that's one of the reasons we are using uh, kind of zipped files in the deep space repository is because we're for born digital content, we're primarily describing things at a aggregate level. And so um, that's one reason we opted for that route. So we can have packages of material. Yep, that's a great point. Our repositories are wonderful for that. The, the clients we have who, who are linking these um, to their photo collections, it's because they don't have quite a large enough collection to justify um, maintaining a repository. All right, another question. Are there any examples of linking the, the uh, AIPs in A-Space, either at your institution or elsewhere? Uh, so if you just mean linking, that's, um, yeah, we primarily, there's a link in archive space to the handle of apes in uh, an outside platform. Um, I have a feeling that's not what you mean, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, and from the REC, um, so we, for kind of more recently, for foreign digital objects um, that 
we get via transfer from our donor organizations. Um, they're like pushed through Archive Medica and then they're um, pushed into Fedora. So that's uh, fairly different than kind of what I was talking about with how we've dealt with digitized material. Um, and that when things are stored in Fedora, then um, a digital object for the ape and a digital object for the dip um, is written to archive space as well as like the component information. All right, we'll give it one more minute for questions. Um, any final comments from our four presenters? Now's your chance. Just a comment maybe that um, uh, Max made a really good point in that when I when and when I was talking about um, developing workflows that that are, you know, like one example of a workflow, you yourself are going to have changes in your institution. Um, and that's, and so the future you is a different user than present you, if that makes sense. <laughs> and that's one of that's one of the approaches that we try to take to development is to try to make things as flexible and agnostic as possible. Um, because that's just sort of the reality. Right, exactly. Yeah, that was a really good point. All right, we don't have any more questions in the chat, um, but everyone's contact information is there. If you would like to reach out to anyone individually, I'm volunteering them for emails. I'm sorry, guys, maybe you didn't want that. Uh, but uh, this recording will be made available on our YouTube and all of the slides will be included, uh, included. So you'll be able to, to look at those later if you have any other questions. Uh, but thank you everyone for attending. Our next webinar in this series will be on integrating ARCs into your archive space workflow, and that will be on March 4th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Thank you, everyone.